We begin the program this evening with new information about the unraveling of the criminal case against Vice Admiral Mark Norman. CBC News has learned not only did the former Conservative government know about Norman's dealings with the Quebec shipyard, it authorized him to speak directly with shipyard executives. And Murray Brewster is here with those new details. Hi, Murray. Hi, Vashi. So what have you learned? Well, last week we found out that certain former Conservative cabinet ministers had spoken to the defence and provided contextual information that may have helped in the Crown staying the charge. Well, one of the bits of contextual information was how did the Conservative government handle the contract as it related to MV Asterix, which is the, um, which is the ship that Vice Admiral Norman is accused of leaking information about. Well, what we found out in talking to uh, former Defence Minister Peter McKay is that not only was Vice Admiral Norman authorized to be working on this project, he was authorized to speak directly to Davy. This is what he had to say. Having taken the decision that we did via Cabinet Committee and, uh, and therefore giving Mark Norman the green light to proceed, he would have had authority to speak to the Davy shipyard. Now that's significant because how can the RCMP and the Crown accuse someone of leaking information to the Davy Shipyard when they had been authorized? Now, when you speak to Admiral Norman's lawyer last week following the charges being stayed, or the charge being stayed, she said that the RCMP may not have been in possession of the information, it may not have seen it, but the information was there for the RCMP to look at because they would have had that information in cabinet records that belong to the former government. And that is information that the current government fought to keep secret. So we know that that pertains and that, that directive from cabinet or the authority via cabinet came uh, when, you know, there's a series of leaks that, that uh, Vice Admiral Norman was accused of making during that period. But then there's also after once the new government had formed. What is this, how does this factor into that? Well, that's interesting because we have to separate the alleged leaks that took place. There were those that took place under the former government and then there is one that took place under the current government. Now, whether or not Mark Norman was authorized to speak to anybody about this is something that would have been brought up in court and would have been fought in court and that's not going to happen now. It may not necessarily have, this new information may not have factored into whether or not the Crown decided to drop the charge. But what we are being told by a number of various sources around this case is that it was the appearance of former Lieutenant General and soon to be former Orleans Liberal MP, Andrew Leslie, in the case and the possibility that he may have something to say that could have possibly tipped this over the edge might explain that uh, day of handshake and embrace between the two of them. It could very well have been. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Murray. The CBC's Murray Brewster. Meanwhile, opposition MPs are calling for an emergency meeting of the Defence Committee to look more closely into how the government handled the Mark Norman case. Joining me now to talk about that, Marco Mendicino is Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Infrastructure. James Bazan is the Conservative Defence Critic, and Randall Garrison is the NDP's Defence Critic, and they're all joining us from the House of Commons. Foye, hello to all three of you. Thanks for making time for us. Hi, Vasily. Mr. Mendicino, I'll start with you. I want to get your reaction to what we just heard from Murray. If Mr. Norman uh, was specifically authorized to speak to Davy Shipyard by the former government, by the former Conservative cabinet, when most of the leaks had occurred, why would Privy Council, why would the PCO have referred that to the RCMP? Well, I'm not privy to that evidence. Perhaps the prosecutor uh, or the Prosecution Service of Canada was privy to it. Um, I think there's some hypothesizing on the basis of the report there. But assuming it to be true, uh, we now know what the result of uh, the trial is, which is that the charges were stayed. What's important for your viewers to know is that this is part of the exercise of core prosecutorial functions. In other words, the decision to proceed with the case, which evidence to lead, which evidence not to lead, which evidence is perhaps exculpatory, which evidence is incriminating, and whether or not to proceed with the matter at all in, in, in the result here are staying those charges all exercised ind independently. Does it concern you though, and I, and I know that obviously you understand the court process better than I do, I'm sure, but does it concern you, think about the optics of this to the person who's watching this. Your government is being accused of going after somebody who was, who w the, the charges against which were, were just uh, stayed, right? And what we have here is, is a former conservative cabinet minister saying, we gave him permission to talk to this Davy Shipyard, 
uh, you know, doesn't it concern you that that information wasn't wasn't available? Was the RCMP didn't act on that or the prosecution service, whatever it was, didn't act on it earlier? A former conservative minister, I would point out, but I digress. Look, I, so, sorry, obviously are you saying the, because he's conservative, all, he's not telling you? All I would say is, is that the, the conservatives are the only ones who are continuing to make the allegation around political interference having played a role in this trial. None of the other players that were involved in the Vice Admiral Norman trial are saying that. Not the prosecutor, uh, the independent prosecutor, uh, not uh, Vice Admiral Norman's uh, counsel. No one is saying that except the conservatives. And I think it's interesting for your viewers to ask the question, why on the one hand, when we've just come out of a trial which has been supervised by a judge, is that not sufficient? And why are you continuing to try to politicize this by taking this to committee, which is an implicitly and an inherently a partisan forum? Mr. Bezan, I want to get you to answer that question. Is it, is it just the Conservatives trying to make this political? Uh, no, because what we're trying to do is actually have uh, a parliamentary investigation into this entire process. What we need to really uh, look at, you know, based upon what, what Murray just reported, uh, proves again uh, uh, that there's more questions here that need to be answered. And a parliamentary committee is a proper place where we can have this type of investigation, get the answers to the questions about how much was political interference. We know that Prime Minister Trudeau, at the very start of this whole process, publicly stated that you know we were uh, going to see Vice Admiral Mark Norman charged and go to court. Uh, now we're learning that they're trying to cover up the very evidence the defense needed. And so maybe this is the story around all the redacted documents and documents that are still withheld from the defense when they were asking for them six months ago. So because they, they definitely didn't provide all the facts to the defense team, they definitely had gone out and besmirched the good name of Vice Admiral Mark Norman and under, undermined his reputation. They blocked him from getting legal assistance. They blocked him uh, from doing his job and almost bankrupt him uh, through this whole process. It just has so many different questions there. I mean, what role did Justin Trudeau play? What evidence did Andrew L Leslie have? And, and, and we want to talk to him at committee. Uh, we want to talk to you know the current Minister of Justice, the current Minister of Public Service, but also Scott Grayson and Judy Foote who were at the cabinet table when these decisions were first made. And it's only through a parliamentary committee hearing that we can do it publicly. We can ask these questions and get answers, not just for parliament but for all Canadians about the level of political interference, um, how much obstruction of justice actually occurred. And well, unfortunately, that, at the end of the day... Well, that's a charge right now. You're saying well, it's obstruction of well, justice? Well, there's, there's definitely a withhold of information. If you look at Marie Hennan's testimony or her, her statement last week when she was uh, with Mark Admiral Norman, uh, she talked quite about a lot about uh, how documents were withheld. Documents came slowly. They dragged their feet on releasing them, and then they were heavily redacted. So you have to question about if they're t you know, withholding evidence and, and, and actually had to redact documents to maybe cover up what Murray Brewster just reported on, then we well, really yes. do have, have, have a situation here that uh, all the facts weren't presented to, to, to the, to the court. I, yeah, what I remember her saying, Mr. Bazan, was that she said you could either uh, you could either give that information up as, at the earliest possible convenience or you can litigate it, and they chose to litigate it. And just one follow-up question for you. Uh, when the breach of tr trust charge was laid, did anyone from the former Conservative government uh, go and volunteer the information that Murray just presented to the RCMP or to the prosecution service? Well, I can tell you that uh, nobody that I know was contacted by the RCMP or through the Public Prosecution Service. What about the uh, other way around? Uh, and and uh, I don't believe that that happened. I believe that there was, you know, I think best, first of all, talk to the ministers that, that were interviewed, Aaron O'Toole, uh, uh, Jason Kenney, and Peter McKay, uh, and find out uh, what conversations took place. I'm unaware of them, uh, other than I know for a fact, based upon what's reporting and conversations I've had with them, that uh, there, there was the, the interviews done by Vice Admiral Mark Norman's defense team. Mr. Garrison, uh, Mr. Mendocino is saying that, that uh, calling the committee together for an emergency meeting would be, and I'm paraphrasing, but essentially a political exercise. What do you think? Well, I signed a request for the special meeting to deal with Mark Norman so that he could get a chance to put his version of events on the record if he chooses to do so. We, here we've had a man who served a country with honor, dignity, uh, and he's had his reputation destroyed by what's happened to him. And I, of course, am interested in finding ways to try and make him whole again, uh, but I'm just not sure that's possible. So the least we can do as parliamentarians is give him a chance to put his story on the record. And we put a broad list of possible other witnesses there so that if the government wants to send somebody to tell their version of this story in public, 
on the record, then they should do that. Uh, I'm not expecting that kind of cooperation. But again, I think the central point here is that Vice Admiral Norman needs to be able to tell his story in public, on the record, and so we can try and undo some of the damage that's been done to his reputation. On the weekend, Mr. Mendocino, Mr. S Minister Sajjan said that, it was, uh, that he regrets the process Mark Norman had to go through. What does that mean? Well, I think he's uh, expressing um, a reflection on, on his part uh, that, that there is some regret that um, you know, Vice Admiral Norman had to go through the process of, of uh, being put before the courts, and I think that that's an appropriate sentiment to have uh, communicated. What, what does um, regret mean? Is, it, does that, is that the feeling of your government? Because you, just, you, you said that this was the way that the court system works, right? So what is to regret that? I think it's a natural reaction given the circumstances that was expressed, I think, from a, uh, from a place of integrity on the part of the minister. And, you know, look, having been in the courtrooms, these are uh, difficult and challenging ordeals. Uh, but I do think that uh, Minister Sejan also communicated that um, the government would be reimbursing Vice Admiral Norman uh, for his legal expenses. That's a decision which is at the discretion of the department, and I think in good faith. And I think from here, uh, what we can take from that is that the administration of justice is resilient. It's resilient from the kinds of baseless allegations that we're hearing from conservatives, which has no other purpose than actually to erode confidence, and we can't tolerate that. This is an important pillar of our democracy. What's, what's the most, has the government determined the most uh, you'll pay for reimbursement? those legal expenses? I think you asked me that last I time, I did, Bashi, and no one and has provided sorry, an answer yet. I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to defer to the minister on that. Mr. Bazant, uh, the, the, uh, the charge that Mr. Medicino is making here is, again, that, that this, this committee would just be a political exercise. What specifically do you need to determine uh, that you think the committee would help you with? Well, I think to follow up on what Randall said, we do want to give uh, an opportunity for Vice Admiral Norman to, to put it on the record with privilege exactly what happened, give him a chance to, to uh, explain how this uh, impacted him and his family and how the government almost bankrupted him. Uh, we want to ask him, like, what, what type of compensation uh, should, should be given? And it's more than just legal fees. And, and you know, one of the reasons we want Minister Sajan there is talk about, he says he regrets it. Well, is he going to apologize? It was his department and, and the Department of Defense that refused to pay for his legal fees. Again, I, I thought we lived in a country where you're innocent until proven guilty. And uh, unfortunately, what they did is they presumed his guilt right away and said, no, you're not getting any financial aid at all. Except if I'm you're the government, your James. Legal, legal uh, situation. We'd like to know who actually provided that decision and, and where the, that, that pressure came from. And ultimately, um, it's, this, this, this is going to be an investigation where we're going to ask a number of questions from all the different players uh, so we can get all the details. And, you know, we, don't, we want to give the same opportunity to, to Vice Admiral Norman that Jody Wilson Ray Bold enjoyed uh, at, at the Justice Committee. Uh, it gave her a chance for her to speak her truth. Well, I think Vice Admiral Norman deserves that chance as well so that he can explain how, how uh, the political uh, motivated attack against him and his career uh, has ultimately uh, just brought his entire family to ruin. Mr. Garrison, uh, I think Mr. Mendocino has pointed out that both the defense counsel at the end, not during the trial, but at the end uh, when, when the charges were stayed, and the director of public prosecution said that there wasn't political interference in the laying or staying of the charge. Is, is that not enough to satisfy Canadians? Well, I guess the problem here is just like with SNC Lavalin. When you say that the system is resilient, it means it's resilient against some kind of pressure. And that what I'm concerned about is the kind of pressure that's being put on that system by the government. And that's a question that we need to explore in this uh, whole Mark Norman affair. And when the minister says he regrets what he had to go through, is what the minister is saying is it that he had information he should have given earlier? Is that what he regrets? Exactly. What, what exactly is this statement of regret? So I'd like to be able to ask the question to the minister directly. What is it you're actually saying when you say that? Could this have been avoided? Uh, was this somehow a mistake on your part? Or was it deliberate on your part to make him go through this process? Those are the kind of things we could address in committee. All right, I'll leave it there, but I thank you, all three of you, for your time this afternoon. Appreciate it. Thanks to Marco Medicino, James Bazant, and Randall Garrison. Thank Thanks you. She was talking about these Liberals. So, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, just exactly why did the Prime Minister try to weigh in on the scales of justice and interfere in the Vice Admiral's court case? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the Director of Public Prosecutions, as well as the prosecutor in this case, have both stated that there was no government interference or contact. As the CBC's Murray Brewster reported off the top of the show, Vice Admiral Mark Norman was authorized by the former Conservative government, according to former Cabinet Ministers, to deal with the Davies Shipyard. A Tory Cabinet committee greenlighted him to communicate directly with an official or officials at Davies regarding a sole-sourced supply ship deal. 
pardon me, what impact does this have on the whole Mark Norman affair? It's time for the power panel in Toronto, Brad Levine of Council of Public Affairs. And here with me in studio, a big welcome to Crestview Strategies, Christine McMillan. Rachel Kern, former director of policy to Stephen Harper, now with Harper and Associates, is also here and the CBC's very own John Paul Tasker. Hi, everybody. Hey, Nice to see you. Uh, Brad, I'll start with you because you're all by your lonesome out there. <laughs> uh, what, let's start with Murray's information because it was pretty interesting. Uh, basically came via Peter McKay who said that and some of the leaks we're dealing with here, the alleged leaks happened during this period in which the Conservatives were in government. And he said he had ex the express authority to deal with Davy Shipyard, which makes you wonder, did the RCMP know that or how much did that contribute to the staying of the charges last week? Well, I, uh, and those are two separate questions. Why didn't the RCMP have that information? Um, and, and, and what did that contribute uh, to the staying of, of those charges? So, uh, actually, I think Murray's piece actually causes more questions uh, to be asked about this. Uh, from, a, from a political standpoint, I think that uh, all the more reason why uh, the Defence Committee should uh, be allowed to meet and bring uh, Vice Admiral Norman uh, to committee uh, I completely agree with, with the case that, that, that this has devastated uh, his reputation, this whole bungled affair. Uh, and he has, I think, uh, you know, at least what parliamentarians can do, uh, the least that they could do at this stage uh, is give him a forum uh, to put on, on the record uh, in a formal setting uh, his side of the story and uncover those questions that Canadians are going to have. Bottom line here is that there's more questions today than there was last week, but I think this is going to further erode uh, Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party's brand about how they do things because uh, as, as tough as this has been on Vice Admiral Norman, I think that the, the folks at home uh, are going to be taking a lot more out of the Liberals on how they've handled all this uh, and it's going to erode uh, Trudeau's brand even further. Christine, let me ask you what you think about the, the idea of that emergency meeting because we heard Marco Mendicino earlier on the show saying, look, we've heard from the Defence Council, we've mm -hmm. heard from uh, the DPP, both of whom say there was not political interference in the staying or the laying of the charge. That said, there are a lot of questions around the way the government conducted themselves. We heard Minister Sajjan say on CTV this weekend that he regrets <coughs> the way that the process unfolded for Mark Norman. Uh, do you think that meeting would be appropriate? So I think I won't prejudge what's going to happen tomorrow at committee, right? And the, the members will get together and they'll, they'll vote themselves as to, to what they're going to consider. But I do think what is important uh, coming out of all of this is that the, there was no political interference, right? Both the prosecution have said that, the defense has said that. All of this has happened sort of without any um, without any say from the prime minister's office. And I think that uh, you know I think that's just an important point to make as this proceeds. I guess the only thing, JP, is that. Uh, while Marie Hannon at the end said there was no political interference mm -hmm. in the staying of the charge, this is the way the justice system should work. She also said in that press conference, she alleged that people in the PCO and PMO were counseling witnesses, right? Or that, right. that there had been some sort of deliberate, and I'm paraphrasing, but deliberate attempt to withhold uh, documents throughout the whole process. That's That was definitely a big part of what we saw in the early legal process, that the PCO was reluctant to hand things over. It seems like the PCO in this case was just really overzealous in its intent to, pu to punish Norman, especially when now it's kind of mm -hmm. coming to light that there are a lot of other people in this town that allegedly leaked this information to other stakeholders. So why did they set their sights only on Mark Norman? And the question is, why did a lot of Conservatives let him twist in the wind? I mean, if if Peter McKay knew about this information, if he knew that he had authorization to speak to Davy Shipyard about the contracts, why didn't he come forward? Why didn't he speak publicly about that to try and exonerate Mark Norman, at least in the press, if not in the legal proceedings? Why didn't he not make it clear that as a member of cabinet, he and others gave him that go ahead? Uh, and I think that he's gone through a lot of trouble now because it's been alleged that he did not have that cabinet approval. Now we know that he likely did. There's a lot of questions to be had here. Was this prosecutorial incompetence or was this a bungling by the police officers or is this just politicians trying to make hay out of an unfortunate situation? So, Rachel, it's like there's two sets of questions. One, why didn't the RCMP seek that information or yeah. it appears they didn't have it. it? Why wouldn't they have had it? Yeah. And two, is it fair to ask why didn't conservatives who knew that volunteer it earlier? Well, they did volunteer it uh, when they were asked and they volunteered it to Mark Norman's defense lawyer, Christine Hennen, who asked, started asking those questions right away. Look, I think Brad is right. We, at the very least, need a parliamentary inquiry into this. I'd argue for a full-scale inquiry. This whole thing stinks. 
Uh, the prime minister said, you know, well before Mark Norman was charged that this was going to end up in the courts. Um, what did he know that the rest of us don't know? Uh, there is inevitably there's, lead to they court would inevitably processes. lead to court processes. He said that a couple of times, in fact, before Mark Norman was formally charged. Uh, we learned that the PCO lawyers were coaching witnesses. Uh, that PCO actually failed to provide exculpatory evidence not just even to the defense, but to the prosecution, to the mm -hmm. Crown who was prosecuting this case. So there were so many questions here that are left unanswered. Uh, and I think we need some kind of inquiry to get to the bottom of this. There's no, I, uh, there really is no explanation for why the RCMP wasn't a asking these questions mm -hmm. during the course of its investigation. Why weren't they talking to ministers who were in charge of the file over the course of the period that was in question? So why weren't they talking to political staff involved? Why weren't they talking to, you know, people in the PCO who were involved in this file? There's no good explanation for that. Do you think the, uh, so, so, like the RCMP and the prosecution wear that, Brad? You, you were talking a bit, but, but I, I'm just asking you as strategists, you know, yeah. do, does the government um, at this point wear it from your, I mean, I know you're saying that they do, but they see, yeah. you know, they have a pretty specific defense here and they're quoting people saying, uh, of authority saying that there wasn't political interference. Right, and, and, see, and I think this goes back to, to when Justin Trudeau uh, makes an answer where there, there wasn't the question, going back to SNC level and Jody Wilson-Raybould, the first, you know, I never directed her, uh, and then we, we saw things unfold. Um, the, the political interference, while they, they claim, and, and I know that the, the Prosecution Service of Canada said that the, the, char the charges were stayed, they haven't been withdrawn, they've been stayed, which is uh, different, um, it's quite different. Um, there was no political interference yeah. in, in the staying of those charges. Um, but we're, we're, asking, we're asking a whole set of other questions at the same time. And again, the, the, for the folks at home, for the voters of Canada, we, we only have a chance to elect uh, you know, our, our, our members of parliament. We don't get a chance to appoint uh, the prosecution service. We don't get a chance uh, to appoint RCMP. We have one outlet, and that is at the ballot box. And if we're talking about, you know, we're five, six months away from, from the next federal election, uh, and we've got a, a you know a, a, an erosion of, of Trudeau's brand, as I was saying earlier, about how he sa he'd come to Ottawa. He said he was going to do things differently. And when we see a case like this, there, it's, there's still questions because there's pieces of information that we don't have access to. And it, what that does is that leads the voter to to make their own conclusions. And that is something stinks to high heaven, and the Liberals are responsible. And that's the takeaway. And that's why, again, this is just the latest chapter in how the, the liberals have said one thing that they, they behave in a certain way, but in reality, uh, you know, something stinks to high heaven. Do you think that's a fair assessment, Christine? Well, I think the government wears everything, right, regardless of, um, <laughs> regardless of right or wrong, right? So I think that, um, so I think, I mean, the government will wear this. And I think the opposition is doing their job is to try to ratchet up the rhetoric and ratchet up the, the outrage and keep people talking about it into October, right? They want to keep it going. So they're going to look for all different types of tools in their toolbox to keep the story going, right? Um, not, you know, sort of disregarding the fact that, that nothing, no political interference happened. The government provided the 8,000 documents or what have you that they were asked to do. Well, they did after some cajoling, right? Like, and, and, and that was one of the points she made. I wonder, though, if, if beyond, even if you take the politics out of it, are there questions the committee could serve, could help to answer around the RCMP specifically? And I mean, we got a brief statement from them on Friday, but mm -hmm. it, could it not serve the public interest to have some parliamentarians ask, look, like, what evidence did you have and when? Why didn't you have, why weren't you asking those questions? I mean, apart from the politics even. Yeah, apart from the politics, but I mean, I'm not going to prejudge what the committee decides, and I think that they'll decide, if they're, tomorrow they'll decide they'll vote if they're going to do it or not, and they've already put forward a list of, of potential witnesses in their, their letter, so I think that the committee will meet tomorrow and decide what their next steps are. I think it just might have been helpful for the government to know that there were other people out there who knew what Norman knew about Davey. And it seems like the police never followed up on that. Like, this whole town is leaky as a sieve, right? Everyone leaks to everybody. So it shouldn't be no surprise to, you know, people in the police service and in the prosecutorial force that there are leaks that happen in this country. What was so different about this one? What was so different about Norman? And but I feel like that's like the key question. That how we did need they an not to, find right? out that Michael Matchett, mm -hmm. you know, the, the the public servant who's at the heart of it all, who's now facing the criminal charges after Norman, also allegedly, allegedly, of yeah. course. Mm -hmm. How did they not know about him until Marie Hennon came forward? You know, that seems like they've dropped the ball big time on this one. Mm. Do, do you think, uh, strategically, do you think the government, like in, uh, like Christine says, yes, they wear stuff, but is this something that sticks for them? Oh, for sure. I mean, look, this is the second example in like six months 
of the government interfering with the justice system. Except I would for encourage, they're saying that they're well, not. Well, sure, but I would, so I would encourage anyone to take a look, listen to that press conference that Marie Hennen held with Vice Admiral Norman, where she talked about political interference in mm -hmm. the justice system. And she tore strips off the government for what she saw as direct interference in the justice system and targeting of Vice Admiral, Admiral Norman. I mean, that was just... I don't a, think she a, ever termed it, though, direct yeah. political interference. Well, That's maybe, like, maybe you know, not with... She but, said they were so, political decisions, right? The so, withholding of those documents. They could have made it yeah, easy and instead they but litigated. That, but, but, she said, but that is political interference. It may not be a political decision to press charges or to stay charges, but it's interference in the process around the court case itself. Never mind what happened leading up to the charge, the, the charging of Vice Admiral Norman, which we don't know about. So yes, I've got, look, we know what the Parliamentary Committee is going to do here. They are tools of Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister. He's going to tell them to shut this well, down. Well, they're dominated by the because, government, which well, they are yeah, in, any, they, under any party. But, uh, yeah. uh, of course, they're going to shut this down just like they did with SNC-Lavalin. We're not going to get any questions out of them. We need an independent public inquiry into this. Hi, I'm Vashi Capellos, host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video. Thanks for watching.